In this video, we share one important reason why you are making losing trades. Hi, I'm Mike Bellafieri, co-founder of SME Capital, and we're a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan. And I'm also the author of the trading classic, One Good Trade and The Playbook. Click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos that we're producing for you in the trading community. See how a junior trader creates an anti-playbook trade to help eliminate his bad trading and bad trades that are holding him back as a trader. Let's dive in. Today's presentation is going to be on Twilio, um, and it's going to be on a false breakout trade that I was making on day one of the earnings report um, when the stock was going up like 40% in just one day. Uh, so this kind of bigger picture, uh, you know, what the uh, results were, they were showing a profit at six cents versus a, um, an expectation of a 11 cent loss and uh, revenue beat as well. Technology has uh, continued to be a market leader uh, with this cloud-based software company uh, leading the way to all-time highs. So just kind of understanding what the market dynamic has been. People have been buying leaders and uh, technology because they figure that they're going to do better in this economy post-corona. And, and they've been selling, obviously, like the weaker names, ones that will probably be hurt uh, more longer term. And just what the intraday fundamentals are, uh, the stock basically went parabolic the whole day and was up 40% um, intraday, which was uh, the biggest move ever actually for this company on earnings and also for really any technology stock that I've been following in a while. Max, I really like how you did that. Really terrific best practice to go ahead and, and see, uh, this is a little bit different, but A, hey, how has this company done in the past after earnings. What are some of the moves that it has made? Actually, I think Jake has done this a couple of times and shared this with us in our group sessions, in our group mentoring sessions, but highly encourage guys in the desk to do more of that. Hey, you know, on earnings, last time it had earnings, the earnings, you know, we moved two ATRs or, you know, of the last 10 times this company has earnings, here are some of the patterns that I'm seeing based on how it trades after earnings and putting that in your back, best, your back pocket. So I really like what you're doing here by starting with uh, an impression, uh, a semi-thesis as to, hey, is this, how much is this up relative to tech stocks and how it's done in the past? So nicely done there. Thank you. Um, and yeah, just kind of the stats of the stock, uh, the ATR, 10 points, uh, volume three, our vol was around five this day. Short float kind of high, but nothing crazy, 12%. Um, definitely higher than what's usual for a big cap tech stock, uh, but not you know crazy high in the 20s or anything. Um, so just kind of seeing what this looks like on the- uh, And let me just set the scene as I do at the beginning of all these videos, which is this is an example of an anti playbook trade. So what we're actually doing voluntarily is going back and trading and, and studying setups that we don't trade particularly well or the trading that we don't do particularly well and learning from that. We can get a lot better by understanding what we do poorly and staying away from it and the types of trading that uh, isn't what we do particularly well and staying away from it, cutting out the nonsense one of the last, in, in one of the last group sessions we had when we were actually all together in New York, as opposed to right now, we're all virtual, uh, was a meeting with the team. And one of the junior traders who had made the most progress of anyone on the team, when asked why he had done so much better, said, I stopped doing all the stupid stuff. I stopped doing all the stupid stuff. So this is our sophisticated way of stopping to do all the stupid stuff. All right, what do you got, Max? Just kind of seeing what this looks like on the daily. Um, as you can see, this has been, you know, uh, brand new all time highs. Um, and, you know, at the time, you know, like we still uh, weren't clearly breaking out to, to uh, new levels in the NASDAQ. So I believe that like, it was more reasonable to kind of be like looking for fades, which I guess now in this market, um, you know, especially just, you know, given the uh, parabolic nature has not been as reasonable. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, they were up basically 200% from 
these all time highs or, or from the lows of that year. Um, and just uh, now I'm actually moving to what this trade looks like. Um, so uh, this is like both like uh, midday, just kind of areas that I've highlighted. Um, first, I believe was around the 11 a.m. time frame, and then um, the next was around maybe 12:30. Both points for me are historically bad parts of my trading. Um, really, just like not places where I excel. Like my focus, really for the most part, is on momentum t uh, times, and you know, like uh, one thing that I like to, 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 you know, like just to really focus on for, for like my trading is trying to get large size and get quick moves. And when I'm doing that like midday, obviously not really a time for me to be pushing this size when, you know, it's going to be more algo driven, a lot more kind of just BS moves and just kind of like more prone to fake outs and even a fake out on the, you know, uh, the, uh, the false breakout where it's like, it seems like, you know, it's gonna pull in, then they just like uh, throw some bids and it goes higher. Liquidity is not gonna be as, as good as well, right? So it's gonna be a little bit harder for you if you wanna trade with a little bit of size to protect yourself when you're wrong. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, especially if I'm gonna be going in, for example, uh, actually here, I'll talk about that on the uh, trade management. But um, yeah, so just kind of like uh, before I actually go through the uh, trade management, what my errors were. If you want to learn three real world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing right now at the top right hand corner of your screen. That's gonna open up this free registration page in the new window. So don't worry, you're not gonna lose this video. You're gonna learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. The biggest error was sizing too much per turn and not thinking bigger picture. So I'm taking too much risk on trying to like time the turn, whereas instead I should just be like focusing on getting a feel for the stock, not as much focusing on trying to time the exact top with my best or with like max size and then get the whole move right and the biggest problem with this is that one if the trade pans out but i take two or three losses on what like would be a good amount of size i basically priced myself out of the trade so if let's say i'm willing to lose 20 percent of my stop trying this if i'm going to be you know like risking 10 percent on two trades where i'm just trying to time the the false breakout based on the tape, you know, there's a good chance that, you know, I'm gonna get it wrong. And if it actually did play out, I would have been totally priced out or I would have been frustrated from the losses and then I wouldn't have traded it well, right? So I think that's just kind of key for me, just like going forward, um, just to like realize that. Um, you know, I am trying to add to my playbook better ways to get into bigger picture trades and more pattern trades because you know, I've been doing well in momentum, but you know, there's not going to be momentum trades, you know, every single day. And I cannot just like rely on that. So I definitely feel the need and pressure to try to expand my playbook. So Shark does this, right? When he thinks something's overbought and he thinks it's ready to turn, he wants to trade the turn or he wants to trade on the front side, anticipating the turn, he's going to give it three tries. So when he's thinking about his risk on try one, he's leaving himself risk for try two, and he's leaving himself risk for try three, and he's leaving himself overall risk for if he really sees the turn and he wants to really size into it. I think you're saying the same thing there. Yeah, basically. Um, and yeah so like you know that's definitely a place where i have to improve on as a trader actually just going through the uh, trade management so kind of what i was seeing um you know in the highlighted areas um i was looking to see if there would be a new breakout and then a immediate rejection so uh, we kind of saw that in the 170 area um where you see it broke it failed at 170 and started to like pull in um this was not my main area of putting on this trade I think that I kind of like noticed that and then was trying later on for, for a similar style setup. But as you see in the next um, highlighted area, um, you know, like 
there would be a wicks breaking out and then a subsequently red bar pulling in and then it would just kind of be doing that for like 30 minutes and in my head i'm thinking all right this stock has come 25 dollars 2.5 atrs just from the open and not to mention that you know it was gapping up so i felt as though that my rr was really solid but you know as you can see it's not as though that there was any volume there showing that there really was going to be that false breakdown like what it should have been is if let's say it broke 173 which was like the prior high and then it went right to like 170 something where i'm like okay i could see this going back to the being like 165 and that is a clear rejection instead of just you know a red bar and a stock that's moving two three dollars per minute anyway um and you know like that just comes with you know just understanding the stock better and just experience um you know but as you can see trying it there you know, with uh, tight stops is clearly just, uh, you know, over trading. Time of day is important, right? So you're going to have, you could have different playbooks for the open, for the middle of the day, and into the close. And we all know that there's one particular trade, which we actually can't talk about, that you love after three o'clock. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which you... My baby. <laughs> yeah, your, your favorite trade. So... And you, you want to be thinking about your risk throughout the day, and I know that you do, saving risk for that trade as well. Um, but you're totally right, which is there can be false breakout trades with rules that you put into a playbook for the open, that you take on the open, that work on the open, that you don't take in the middle of the day that you may or may not take into that close of trading uh, hour, into that last hour of trading. Um, so that's, and, and you know, one of the things that's particularly helpful to, to do this is to think about the day in three separate sessions. The open is one session, the middle of the day is another session, the close of trading is another session, and to create a demarcation between those three periods of each day. To actually physically get up off the trading desk and take a scheduled break for 10 minutes or more after the open, after the afternoon session, where you're, you're really putting in those barriers and then spending some time during that break thinking about, hey, what are the stocks that I wanna trade midday? What are the setups that I wanna trade midday? How do I wanna attack this new session? Get a clear head, recharge, restart, and then attack those very specific different portions of the day with very specific playbook trades that work best for you, that you trade well, for each different period. That's a really advanced way to trade during the middle of the day and you're starting to think like that by making that very significant distinction which is, hey, this doesn't work for me probably mostly because it's middle of the day but but might work on the open. You know, if you're gonna be a fade trader for stocks that gap up right on the open is gonna be a very advantageous time at 10 o'clock is going to be a very advantageous time at 11 30 is a completely different trade absolutely and as you can see here by the executions you know uh the first one it broke 170 my thinking there was okay we just broke the round number maybe we stop people out it's starting to like go back under and my thinking was all right we just had a pretty parabolic move and the reason for this uh rally i remember it was on cnbc there was this mention that there were calls being bought and I figured that, all right, this is just kind of pushing like retail buyers into this, kind of just like uh, chasing this up. It's not really a true reason for there to be a volume explosion. So was that I thought one of that, the, that, was that Nigerian? Yeah. Calling yeah, it out on you? Yeah. So well, um, we'll I, I saw that next time we see him. Yeah, absolutely. He screwed me over. <laughs> um, but, you yeah, know, so he um, so like the rally was like five dollars on that comment so, so nigerian was calling out unusual uh options activity and the particular name in the middle of the day 
and that caused a little bit of a spike. Yeah. So like my thinking was that that was gonna create a false breakout, and then because it was just like retail traders buying it, pros would then like come in and kind of smack it back down to where it was before. So I was thinking that like the one seventy stuff would have like made sense, but as you can see, you know, it probably should have held under one seventy at least for one or two candles for that to be valid. And then it, it would have still given me a pretty good RR. And there was more volume on the break than on the red bar. And like right there, that was probably a 50 cent loss, which is fine. But you know, like with that size, it starts to slowly add up. And then I try again at 172, that's a fake breakout. Or, you know, are thinking that. And then finally, what well, you know, on that big like red bar, like my thinking is, all right, they finally hey, let me just jump in right here because yeah. I know you're more advanced than most of the people who are watching this right now. So, you know, so Pete and John Nigerian run a service. Let's explain unusual options activity. Okay. Do you want to do it or you want me to do it? I can give it a try. You yeah, you give it a try. You're you're sure. you're an options expert, so you can run. <laughs> sure. So basically uh, what they're doing is they are highlighting unusual options activity, which means that there is a, um, a large volume of contracts being bought or sold um, you know, in a particular name. So for example, if let's say like usually there's only a thousand contracts being traded in a stock or in a particular um, you know, expiration, if suddenly there's five or 10,000, it probably means that there is some institutional player that is coming in and placing a large bet on the uh, direction of the stocks. What that can tell you is that there are people with like real money coming in with a, you know, a thesis backed um, trade, uh, uh, most likely. And then uh, many times people will just kind of follow what is called the smart money. Um, and that's definitely one of the more common trades that they go over and discuss in their service and on CNBC. Is that something you watch at all, Max? The show or or no 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 the, oh. yeah do you have, do you have an indicator for unusual options that you watch? Um, I watch it, but uh, not as much since uh, you know just now I'm just like focusing on stocks and very just like short term moves. If I you know like started to like go back to um. Options trading, that that would definitely be something that I'd be watching. I found from my experience that usually that works best when you're trying to anticipate a breakout or breakdown, and you let's say have a higher volume move in the stock that's also um, accompanied by that options volume. So like let's say for example in uh, Tesla, right? It's kind of been uh, consolidating now the last couple of weeks. What if let's say today by the close it just suddenly goes up $20 and you just see a flurry of call volume. It's probably a good sign that there's gonna be follow through the following day. So even if let's say that you're not trading options, you can still use that as a thesis for wanting to play that momentum the following day because it probably means that smart money is starting to pile back into the stock. So like, uh, that's how I would use it or have used it. Yeah, so like just like you can see here just kind of how the smaller, you know, candles, like it wasn't really doing much and I was making patterns that weren't there. Is is kind of, uh, you know, essentially what this was. So just kind of the uh, tape reading, uh, just kind of like summarizing what for me a, a false breakout trade is. Uh, my trigger was when I saw the previous high break with little follow through and then a subsequent pull in and failure to go back to the high quickly. So the reason why this would be like my trigger is that I figured the new high was based on a stop run and that there were sellers that were waiting there. There was potentially a heavy area and that this was kind of finally the move. Um, and you know, like that's just kind of the idea behind a, a false breakout trade. I think these trades are a lot easier in stocks that are cheaper and much more thick because you can clearly see when a very particular price is holding. So for example, I've been trading LK a lot the last couple of days. It's like a $2 stock. It's the uh, Chinese name that had the accounting fraud. And um, one of the main triggers for me would be seeing it come up or come down to a whatever price that was either support or resistance, see them really hammer that price, but it just uh, not drop or not break and then see the opposite side. So if let's say it was trying to break out and there was a held offer 
and then see like the bid start to decrement, that would tell me that there's a seller there that is not budging. So kind of the same theory here, except in Twilio, a $170 stock that has a spread of 25 cents, it's obviously harder to see a held price because there's not gonna be as much liquidity per cent that there would be in let's say a $2 stock. Um, so this trade could work better in something like a, a uh, LK rather than that of a Twilio. So just kind of a trade review. So just going back uh, this month, uh, this is overall my worst trade setup. And um, you know, is trying to play false breakouts. Uh, the reason I tried um, adding this um, is because if you're clearly able to see the false breakout, usually it's a start of a trend reversal and then you're basically in from the best price. And you can um, you know, add along the way, like if let's say I was actually right on this trade and this thing just crashed right through 170, broke the low, that was before uh, uh, Nigerian spoke, I basically would have a starter position from an incredible price. And that's kind of my thinking. But, you know, just kind of saying it, it definitely sounds as though that's kind of more hope than actual sound trading logic uh, when you're trying just to pick out points in a chart that haven't proven to be significant yet. Um, and that's something that I've quickly realized, um, you know, for uh, all my trading, that is midday. And how that's been kind of my biggest focus, you know, over the last like, month or two is really cutting back and not completely eliminating midday trades, but just picking my spots more carefully and really just having better reasons to be in what I'm in. Max, are you tracking your fake breakout trades in TraderView and measuring your trading stats for that particular type of trade? Yeah, so this tag for me is false breakout trade. and. Uh, that tag is my worst one currently. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think that but that's, one that's significant. My... I mean, it's it's one thing to say. Anecdotally, I feel that my worst trades are fake breakout trades. You might be right about that. It's another thing to say. I've measured and studied my fake breakout trades after I've tagged every single one of them in trader view. And in fact, they are my worst trades statistically. And then now I got to do something about that, which is either a eliminate them completely or tweak them so that you keep the ones that might work or get better at, at the ones that, that may not. Um, so super important to do that. So you and I were talking a little bit about this offline, and one of the things that I see when really, really elite discretionary traders do very, very well, save a, save a few. There, there are some discretionary traders where this will not apply, but, but a large majority of them do better when they put rules in place. They do better when they put more variables specific variables into the trades that they trade best. That they understand and they can, they can say in detail, when I'm looking for a fake breakout trade, I wanna see X, Y, Z, one, two, three. When I see traders not trading at their best or when I see traders underperforming, they have general comments about their trading and the trades that they're not trading particularly well. And so, one of the things that you can think about here is being really, really specific about the fake breakout trade you want to take. So you're making a great distinction. Midday is probably not the best time to take it. You're making a good distinction by saying, I want to see the type of volume that gets me into the trade. So, you know, some ideas for people to be thinking about for fake breakout trades and any rules to that is, what is the time of day that these trades are most likely to work? You're gonna have completely different results for this trade, open, midday, close, period, full stop. Volume explosion or lack thereof. Uh, do you wanna tell me what you mean by that? Sure, yeah. So like, for example, right, when the, uh, the, uh, there was that um, 170 break, that came on strong volume, right? So there's, less reason to doubt that breakout than if let's say that was one of the lowest volume bars of the day. Because I like, keep in mind, if we're trying to, to trade a false breakout 
or breakdown, rather than wanting to see the volume come in, we want to see the volume uh, not come in as kind of uh, the way to have confirmation, right? That you know the trend should go to the opposite because there's not that much uh, commitment in that final move. So I think that that is one of the biggest factors. And the same way how in the follow-up trades, you know, around like 172, um, there was not that much volume on the pull-ins, right? So really for that to have worked, there should have been the low volume uh, continuation from 170 and then the sharp red bars with bigger volume. And that would have served as more confirmation that I was right rather than these just being regular trades and part of just kind of the midday churn. So let me jump back in here. It's gonna matter how much the stock actually gaps up on the open. There's going to be different expectations of your day as to how stocks move if they gap up 1% relative if they gap up 20 plus percent. There's gonna be, and, and you're gonna you're gonna to wanna to craft rules around gap up percentages or think about that. One of the other things that you might think about, and I know Shark does this really well, when you're looking for things to turn is yes, the example that you're talking about on the tape, but there's another example on the tape that uh, this is this is a very old school insider baseball tape reading signal that we used to talk about back in the day when the markets were really, really strong that really typified a turning point. And that is heaviness on the tape. So if something makes a new high and does trade a little bit higher, but it's much harder for the stock to go up. It's not going up as much as it did in its past moves. And there's still lots of volume coming in. We, we call it heaviness on the tape. And that can be a way for you, and this might be a different trade for you overall. This might be a different name, might have a different tag, but that's gonna be something that you look at. And that's gonna have a different entry requirement. And you should be thinking about entry requirements for this overall. So for fake breakouts, are you gonna be the one who shorts that uh, into the fake breakout with a stop against the high? Or are you gonna watch to see it make that fake breakout, pull in and then short it at a much lower price after it's made that fake breakout, pulled in and is now much lower with the stop against the high? That's gonna be, you're gonna to have to set rules for how you enter these fake breakouts. And it's gonna matter whether or not you do short into the fake breakout or if you short a little bit lower. You're gonna to start to come up with a thesis as to whether or not the news catalyst is overvalued and you, may, you might develop rules over that. So there might be certain things you just stay away from. A day one blowout earnings, blow out new product might be something you don't take for a fake, for a fake breakout. Um, daily chart overextension, it's gonna matter if this is overextended on a daily chart relative to it just made a new high on a daily chart. And you're gonna wanna develop rules for that. It's gonna be a better fake breakout trade if we're overextended on our daily chart and now we're finding an overextension on our intraday charts to make that, to, to trade that turn. You're gonna obviously make more with something overextended on the daily chart, and then you see it overextended on the intraday chart and it turn, then something that is, is, is not overextended on the daily chart, because it has so much more that it can possibly go down. Uh, distance from VWAP, so, Hey, if this is uh, two ATRs away from VWAP, then you've got more you can make if you're making a return into VWAP than if it's 50 cents away from, from VWAP. So how far away it is intraday, how extended overall it is intraday, you can develop rules based on technical indicators uh, and go from there. I also think one of the things that really, really good tape readers do, really, really good active traders do, is that let's say they give it a shot on a fake breakout. They think they see it, they short it, they think this is towards the top. They watch what it looks like when it's pulling in and they know what it's supposed to look like 
when the stock is going to crack. And if it doesn't crack, they make a trade decision quickly to lighten up or to get flat. They know that when it's pulling in, if there's just too much buying on the bid, that that's a trade decision for them and they probably should get flat. So they can minimize bad decisions to short and to fake breakouts. They can improve their overall resort, their overall reserve results for these fake breakout trades because they can get out of their losing trades based on observation on the tape and rules they can develop on the tape to take a little bit lighter losses when they're when they're not right. And then you can you can develop rules about how's the market doing, how this how the stocks in the sector doing, how's the sector ETF doing. If it's not cratering, you may decide to make trade decisions based on that. I'm not suggesting to you in any means that you should be thinking about all of these things. I'm not suggesting to you you need to do that. I'm saying to you you will see improvement if you're in the group of the minority, the majority of traders who do better when they put rules in place. The odds are you probably are one of those traders when you're thinking about your trades. And, and you don't have to be, I'm not suggesting you should be 100% systematic. I'm just saying be more systematic. I'm not saying be 100% rule-based. I'm just saying be more rule-based and that will get you to make a couple of jumps of improvement in this type of trade. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they're producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB. Train and trade well.